Some of them would wish they did. And meanwhile, the, the Palestinians get incredibly angry and frustrated. And when you go through these checkpoints and get funneled from a space 50 people wide into a space four people wide over the course of an hour and a half, and then told by a soldier to go back to the end of the line because <clears throat> you did something wrong, you get really, really mad. And um, uh, part of what I wanted to do was, uh, was see that and, and maybe even feel it myself and, uh, and feel what the soldiers felt as well. That was emotionally the hardest chapter to write because I had to change sides in the middle and I liked uh, people on both sides and uh, that was really, really hard. Uh, but the roads there are key. Um, that's the only place the army can can travel with impunity. They uh, they have, you know they have a giant network of uh, of intelligence sources. They have snitches, in other words, who who help them do their work. I think the U.S. Army lacks that in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is why so many of our soldiers still get killed. We've built these gig this road from um, Kabul to Kandahar. We spent two hundred ten million dollars on it, I think, and the uh, the day it was dedicated, the dignitaries were afraid to travel it to get to the ceremony because it's too dangerous. Uh, you can't protect an edge that long very well. So uh, roads come with all these ironies. Um, the other, uh, maybe the most amazing road I, I traveled in the last few years was at, uh, on the base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where I went for the Times Magazine. When you leave the, the the central base where there's McDonald's and um, a golf course and all these trappings of America and you head to the super secure Camp Delta area, you go on this piece of road that's like a, a, a piece of ribbon candy. It goes back and forth on itself with all these orange barriers and there are machine gun nests on both sides. And even though it's only soldiers maybe the occasional prisoner who travels this road. It's like, it's like San Francisco's Lombard Street squished into uh, 100 yards. And they want to make sure, I think, that no insurgent who snuck in there somehow could blast through at high speed and ram the fence around the camp. But um, there's military control of a road. I mean, that, that's, that's the extreme. And I think the other extreme is our the roads we're trying to uh, protect in Afghanistan. And, or maybe another extreme, in another sense, would be um, there's a little section in here that, that talks about some roads, ancient roads, kind of recently discovered, mainly from the air in the American Southwest in New Mexico. These roads appear that, you know, from thousand years old maybe mm -hmm. or more um, and and then an attempt to oh disconnected this Pueblo settlement and that Pueblo settlement and no no and then eventually further archaeology and further the thinking hmm these roads were perhaps not meant for the living they have all this religious significance and the word road in this Pueblo language means actually channel for life's breath something like that and it's this that's that's the far. <laughs> that's you're the right, other that's pole. The, you're right. That's the other pole from the yeah. incredibly ugly, paranoid <laughs> um, road meant to prevent death. Um, why not open this up for uh, if you guys have questions um, for Ted um, shortly? Or, I think, or for you, Bill. That or be fun. I, I don't know what I have to do with um, this topic, but um, <laughs> maybe just just to. Again, suggest the kind of um, breadth of this book. I'll, I'll just um, ask you to talk about one more um, uh, subject in here, which is uh, this ice road. In Ted mentioned he was in Ladakh in in Kashmir in India, um, and there's this incredible story of a place that's snowed in. I don't know most of the year. And uh, in the Himalayas, and and the one way out is when the river freezes, as long as it stays nice and frozen, it's like a 40-mile walk you can do. And he did, um, along with a bunch of kids who were trying to get out of the village. Um, and it's so 
sort of paradisal up in there. Why do they want to leave? And and there's it's it's full of paradox, and it's also a sort of beautiful um, setting. And but but it's can you say a little bit about that? Well, yeah, that um, it's a part of Ladakh, which is a part of Kashmir. It's the Buddhist, the Tibetan Buddhist part of Kashmir. It's 60 miles from China and 80 miles from Pakistan. Uh, uh, it's gorgeous. Uh, there are monasteries there, hundreds of years old, built onto the side of cliffs. The people are incredibly nice, incredibly welcoming. Um, I went there twice, once in the summer and once in the winter, and if I could afford it, I'd go back next week because uh, it's just fantastic. And something, what's happening there is the Indian army, which posts thousands of troops along the border with Pakistan, needs to feed them in the winter. And they can't do that now without airlifting food in because the passes get uh, snowbound. The passes are 14, 12, and 14,000 feet high. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, it's right in the book. I, it's wrong in my brain. Um, so they want to build a road through the canyon that the frozen river passes through. And that, w that would mean people could easily access this isolated valley year-round. And if you're from here and you've been places and seen what access to a beautiful place uh, means, you, you want to say to them, oh, don't do that. Don't, put, don't let them put a road there. It's going to wreck everything. And, um, and then you find when you say that to people, they look at you like, well, what do you know about it? Uh, what do you know about being stuck in this this snowy place nine months a year with all these people who tell you to pray several times a day and and we can't get internet and and um, uh, my guide my guide uh, is this great guy who's he's very uh, religious but he's also interested in the outside world and uh, he sees both sides of this and his his son who's the age of my daughter had the exact same poster of uh, Avril Lavigne, the singer, on his, on his mud wall. Um, and there, in his house there are cattle in the, on the ground floor, because that's how it's built. It keeps them warm in the winter. And um, the other part of the ground floor is their latrine. But upstairs is Avril Lavigne smiling in her alluring way, and, and he wants... Um, he wants to hear more of that music, and uh, and he and Avril is not going to visit his valley, and uh, so like so many young people, especially in so many remote parts of the world, he wants to be connected, and this is a this is a global theme that seems stronger than ever in the world's history, as far as I can tell. Young people want to leave and want to get out and want to be part of, of what's happening. And uh, a few, there's a few old people who say, well, I guess the road will be good, but I don't think, I don't think it'll be good for religion. I don't think people are going to say their prayers as much when there's a lot of traffic on that road. And you say to yourself, yep, that's, that's right. And, um, and the young people say, life will be so great when this road comes in. And you think, oh my God. Uh, uh, if only I were the ruler of the world, I could, um, I could say no road. Uh, I could, if, only, if only I were the best professor ever, I could say, uh, you don't want that. But I can't. And they, uh, as a teacher there, uh, there's a kid there. Well, he's not a kid. He's, he, he grew up as a, um, a refugee from the Chinese invasion of, of Tibet as they see it. Uh, the Chinese, of course, think they liberated Tibet, but uh, to this young man, he had to flee Tibet. He, uh, he grew up in a refugee camp, an SOS children's village outside of Leh. He worked in Delhi in video production and then missed his, his homeland. And he went back to this village and he said, he's